Uh, the problem with the Second World War is not so much how did it begin, but when did it begin? The Second World War was not some precise sudden event, like the first. The First World War, as we now call it, uh, is perfectly simple as, as a, a beginning. In July 1914, all the great powers were at peace, and a month later, at the beginning of August 1914, bang, they were all at war. And you can really describe that, as I've tried to do, in terms of a week or a month at most. But the Second World War, exactly when did it become a Second World War, a World War? When exactly, in fact, did it become a war at all? Suppose you said, right, a declaration of war indicates that the World War started. Well, then you'd have to go back to April 1932, when Mao Zedong and Chu Ti declared war on Japan in the name of the Yangtze Soviet. That wouldn't do. Uh, I suppose for the Abyssinians, it started in 1935. For the Spanish Republicans, it started in 1936. For the Czechs, even though they were defeated without an actual war, it started in 1938. Uh, for us English people, it started, I suppose, on the 3rd of September, 1939. And indeed, I was once mistaken enough to write a book called The Origins of the Second World War, which worked up to the 3rd of, of September, 1939, which was the day when Great Britain declared war on Germany. And in my last paragraph, I realized I'd written on the wrong subject, because I finished up by saying, what I've described is the origins of a minor conflict in Europe, which uh, the effects of which have been uh, lost without trace and were uh, only a preliminary to the great real world conflict which came later. At any rate, uh, I thought I would try and present it in different terms, accepting that there were a series of wars which seemed, of course, very uh, serious and great to those who were involved in them. The actual Polish war, for instance, lasted a fortnight so far as serious fighting was concerned. But it was a very great war while it was on and in its effects for the Poles. The war between France and Germany, in which British troops were involved to a lesser extent, in May, June 1940, lasted for something like, at most, six weeks. For any dynamic point of view, uh, a fortnight. And the Germans, all told, in conquering Europe between 39 and 1940, suffered fewer casualties than they had suffered, say, during the Battle of the Somme in 1916. That these were all preliminaries. And more than this, I'm, I'm sure it will sound paradoxical to those of you who can remember the, the Second World Wars, indeed I can, it sounds in a way paradoxical to me. From June 1940, until June 1941, there was virtually peace in Europe, and for that matter, generally in the world. There were minor aggressions, there were minor conflicts, and there was a, a running uh, or undercurrent of conflict. When I say that there was no great war, I suppose what I mean predominantly is that there was no land war. Apart from a very short-lived engagement in Greece, British troops were not in conflict with the Germans at all in Europe during that period, and only to a very slight extent, uh, even in North Africa. The only striking episode in British history was a war between England and Italy in North Africa, which, although a very dramatic, sensational affair, had little relevance to the world struggle. Because even though the actual world war did not start until much later. This was a world struggle. Unlike the First World War, where we still have doubts what the issues were, whether this really was a conscious struggle for the mastery of Europe or of the world, the Second World War, I think, has a more defined character. And it was this. There were some of the great powers possessing empires or, pr or protected zones of their own who could derive adequate resources from what they possessed. That was true of the United States, a vast protected role of the whole, really, of the American continent was America's and nobody else's. It was true of the British Empire, it was true of the French Empire. 
two of the great industrial countries of the world did not possess such zones. They were short of resources, short of background, and quite apart from other things, their national feeling, their political aims, such as uh, German Nazism, they were discontented with their lot and were seeking to break into the monopoly of the other great powers. This is a pattern which had followed all through the 1930s. There were, one can divide them absolutely precisely. On the one hand, the contented empires. On the other hand, the discontented aggrieved powers, Germany and Japan. Japan throughout the 1930s was aspiring to make first China and then the whole of the Far East, a, what they called it, uh, the greater Asia co-prosperity sphere. When people use the term co-prosperity, of course, they don't mean it's going to benefit those they conquer. It means it's going to benefit the conquerors. Co-prosperity is just an, a name for grabbing other people's resources. It sounds very impressive. And in the same way, for a very long time, German leaders, and particularly Hitler, had looked forward to a greater Germany with greater resources, greater land, but it's essentially breaking through this structure of monopoly which penned them in. And this is quite different from saying that they necessarily aspired to world war, still less to world conquest. Germany and Japan sought a place, a secure, recognized place at the table of the great. They wanted to sit down with the great empires as equals. Of course, when you want that, you always want to be superiors too. But this is the story of German policy, particularly from the time when uh, Hitler came into power. It's the story of Japanese policy. And the others were on the defensive. One of the things I think which historians have seen more clearly with the uh, passing of the years is how closely the two questions, what one can call the European question and the Far Eastern question, were linked up. For instance, the whole policy of appeasement, which Chamberlain followed from 1937 to 1939, was largely designed to get Europe settled so that British forces could move to the Far East and resist Japan. And on the other side, the reluctance of the United States to get involved in the European theater sprang to a very great extent from the consciousness in Washington that the Far East was their most pressing concern and the one where they really had no associates, that the other, the European countries were too busy in Europe. Now that there were two strands of story running and finally running together. Therefore, it seems to me that the story of the Second World War begins, well, it begins so far back as you like, but as a practical proposition, it begins in June 1940. In June 1940, the readjustment of Europe was complete. It had been achieved at fantastically low cost in men and in equipment. As I suppose never been an imperial conquest which had been achieved so easily as the way in which Hitler had established German domination over Europe. In June 1940, Germany dominated the entire continent of Europe, either directly through her power or indirectly, as with the few remaining uh, neutrals, by her influence and requirements. It didn't go further and say Europe was united for the only time in its history. And there seemed little likelihood that this situation could be reversed from within Europe. We know that, in fact, any resistance in Europe, though sometimes very honorable, was ineffective, ineffective, uh, that's to say, in, in pushing the Germans back. The only remnant of this earlier war, the war which had started in 1939 and terminated uh, in, the, at, in the railway carriage of Compiègne when the French signed the armistice. The only remnant of this earlier war was that Great Britain remained in the war. And indeed, this was the basic contribution which Great Britain made to the world war that came later. As Stalin put it much later time, the Russians gave blood, the Americans provided money, the British provided time. They ensured that something like a warlike situation would remain.
After the attempt by Hitler to invade Great Britain in uh, August, September 1940, neither side could strike decisively against the other. There were very ineffective bombing raids. That again sounds ironical to anyone who lived through the Blitz, but compared to any real uh, heavy air bombardment, the Blitz carried no weight, achieved no result. The one factor which might have changed the war, which threatened Great Britain and brought her to the brink of defeat, was, of course, the struggle in the Atlantic of the German U-boats uh, against the British convoys, and this provided a link with the war that was to come after. Otherwise, British and German armies weren't fighting. Germany, in, in fact, enjoyed a real stand down. The, the German people reached their highest standard of life, I mean, in, in this period, in 1941, when we in this country were already facing fairly limited rations. Uh, much of the German army was, was demobilized. Uh, German munitions production was cut down. There was a sort of feeling the war was over. Yet it was not over because of the theoretical fact that Great Britain maintained the war. And this was one of the things which imposed a strain upon Hitler. He could not just say, right, it's finished. He often talked about how he'd like to make peace with Great Britain, but he never attempted it seriously. And probably any attempts he made would have been rebuffed. One of the fascinating topics, like well, still well worth studying, is why did the British keep going so well? Uh, I don't mean to say effectively. They were not having any effect against Hitler at this time until they could bring a greater war to, to bear. But why did they sustain, why did they hold out when their cause seemed impossible, when everybody said, well, Hitler can't invade Great Britain? but then Great Britain will never be able to defeat Hitler. What kept them going? Some hope for the future, some, I think, often an echo of the past, a relic, a memory of earlier uh, times when they stood alone against Napoleon, dragging on for 10 years. In the end, something would come right. However, that's a mere preliminary. What should Hitler do, He's faced with this position that the, Europe was his? Should he just rest on his laurels? Fairly clear that he anticipated further struggle. It may be also that having once mobilized his army, as he said, he must use it. And we know that after 12 months of deliberation, actually the deliberation was less, although the preparation took most of the six months, his, Hitler's decision was to invade Russia. Here is a, one of the very rare cases, I think, about how a war begins. There are wars which have been planned in the sense that, that countries have built up their armies, have envisaged that there would be a conflict. For instance, when the Germans built a navy against Great Britain before 1914, they assumed, yes, one of these days there will be a naval war. But in, this is, it, it was an actual case of Hitler and his staff sitting down months beforehand and saying, actually they said, first of all, 15th of May, then the weather and other things interfered, and they said, 22nd of June, uh, 1941, very, very rare that there should be such an absolute precise timetable. That's where we do it. Why on the 22nd of June? Not because there was anything dramatic happening then, but it would fit in with their timetable. That unlike most wars, unlike, I'm prepared to say, Hitler's earlier wars, this was a war of absolutely clear-cut determination, uh, with no argument, with no uh, hesitations. Why did he do it? People have talked about this a lot, I think too much. Uh, some people say he wanted to destroy communism, some that he wanted to acquire great stretches of, of Russia in what's he called living space, Lebensraum. Uh, Others, in more practical terms, that he feared the ultimate strength of Russia. He argued, we are the stronger now, but as soon as Russia gets the stronger, the Russians will attack us. We've no idea what Russia's intentions were, except, of course, a clear-cut intention to survive. There's no indication at all of preparations.
to attack Germany or even to take precautions. Stalin, we know, was absolutely sunk on the doctrine that until Great Britain had been defeated, Germany would not attack him. But when we look at the papers, it's absolutely simple why it was done. Because the German generals and Hitler were absolutely confident they would win. So why not go ahead? How simple it would be. The, in an earlier stage, there had been arguments about whether they should attack France. Many of the generals doubted whether France could be defeated. Hitler insisted it was possible, and it was. The French army was supposed to be the greatest in Europe. If France could be defeated within a month, Russia could be defeated within a few weeks. And I think the very practical, simple, straightforward answer to the question, why did Hitler invade Russia, is because he was confident he would win. And that with this, all serious threat to German domination of Europe would disappear forever. Uh, indeed, he said as much very often, once the, the British have lost all hope in Russia, they will make peace. The German Empire would be consolidated. At the same time, Hitler was becoming, as victors always do, as Napoleon did for that matter, but even more so, Hitler, with each success, was becoming more confident and greedier. And even before he attacked Russia, he was making the next jump. Earlier on, he had said the final battle for the world will be between Europe, led, of course, by Germany, and the United States. But it will not happen in my time. It will happen in a hundred years' time. After he'd conquered France, he still said, well, the battle between Europe and America won't happen in my time. It'll happen in 20 years. But the moment he had decided that Russia could be eliminated in the early days of 1941, he said the battle for the world will be starting in 1942 or thereabouts. We want to get Russia out of the way, acquire Russia's resources, then for the great war against America. Uh, I think Hitler's mind, like most people's expectations, you know, moved in and out. But at any rate, there is no doubt why the Germans went to war with Russia. They went to war in the absolute blind confidence that they could win. It would be such an easy war that it would be inconceivable to turn it down. This was a decisive step towards world war. It was a, a more decisive step than the, than the uh, Germans expected, of course, because instead of being defeated within a month, as everyone has expected, as the German generals had expected, as the British general staff had expected, as the American uh, army had expected, Russia survived. That Germany was being faced with what was not a world war in, in Russia, but at any rate, a conflict of the greatest size, and with it, the implication that German power would not necessarily survive in, or not necessarily be sustained on this level. But we must also bring in the other side. It is not possible to understand the origins of the, the how the, the Second World War actually came into being without considering the similar story of Japan in the Far East, because here too, the Japanese had great successes. They had successes before the war in which uh, they had established their control over most of the coast of China, most of the, the great Chinese ports and so on. And here again, it's somewhat slight parallel with, with Great Britain, just as Great Britain kept a war going by merely existing. So nationalist China kept a war going by merely existing. The Chinese did no fighting against Japan, or virtually no fighting, between 1938 or early 1939 and the end of the World War. But they were still theoretically in existence. Incidentally, China did not declare war on Japan until after Pearl Harbor. But there they were. And this tempted Japan to go further along the coast. And with, of course, the collapse of the European powers with their empires, that's to say the collapse of the Dutch Empire, the collapse of the French Empire, these were wide open. The, the Japanese saw a, the, uh, the opportunity, the openings, to break the ring, to acquire raw materials for themselves. In the background, the factor which, more than anything else, shaped and conditioned the Second World War,
was the United States. Indisputably at that time, the greatest industrial power in the world, a power with a stake in European affairs and a stake in Far Eastern affairs, a power torn between the overwhelming desire of a great many of its people to keep out of war, and on the other hand, a similar desire to assert American principles of democracy and of what one could call free trade, or really the basis of American policy was free investment for American money all over the world. That was the basis of America's liberal economy. On the one side, in Europe, it was very much to America's interest to keep Great Britain going. Not only interest in an economic sense, interest in a strategical sense. For, what, 150 years, ever since the Declaration of Independence in 1776, Great Britain had, willingly or not, supplied a buffer, strategical buffer, between the United States and Europe. It was for this reason, to a great extent, that the United States had entered the First World War in 1917. More than this, Great Britain now represented the only way in which American power, if it were going to be reasserted, could get back into Europe. From very early on in the war, American strategists envisaging that there would be a war between Germany and the United States pointed to Great Britain as they said their great impregnable aircraft carrier from which American troops, they hardly thought about the British Army at all of course, uh, American troops would get back into Europe. And from this point of view of course the struggle in the Atlantic directly involved the United States. For American uh, battleships, destroyers and so on, the Second World War began a long time before Pearl Harbor. It began in the summer of 1941. Uh, Germany and the United States were at war in the Atlantic and Hitler kept out of it uh, because he didn't want to provoke America into the war. And on the other side, America was following in a different way a similar policy of holding back Japan. Here again, we can point to a, a precise moment when the Second World War in the Far East became, in my opinion, inevitable when it was decided on. And this was not a Japanese decision. It was an American decision. In August 1941, the United States government imposed a total embargo on supplies to Japan, particularly supplies of oil and of credits. From that moment, Japan was doomed either to surrender at will or to go to war. The Japanese had six months' supply of oil. In, actually, as usual, they uh, overstated their distress. They could have lasted out for a year or two, but the doctrine was we have only got six months. Before that, we must break through the ring. In a anything but a technical sense, uh, the United States had declared war on Japan by this attempting to close the ring. Now you can imagine a lot of world in which the ring at one time had been quite close to Japan itself, quite close to Germany, and had been pushed further and further out, but was still there. Uh, and in each case, the power which was encircled had tried to break through. By the autumn of 1941, therefore, the situation was of these rather smaller wars was changing in some ways for the better, some ways for the worse. On the one hand, the German predominance in Europe, which had seemed so complete, and so unshakable in the summer of 1941 was now gravely threatened. Uh, it's difficult to sort of reform the picture. How did people, we understand how people saw the war between Russia and Germany in June 1941, everybody virtually, there were a few exceptions of whom I was one, said Russia will be defeated. 
by the autumn, there was, most people were still, I mean, strategists, experts were still shaking their heads and saying, well, it's being tougher for the Germans than we expected, but the, Russia's bound to collapse. By November, it looked as if Russia was going to survive. And, of course, there was a short period when the Russians themselves thought they'd already won, and Stalin was talking about complete victory in 1942. This was a fantastic turn of events. The other aspect of this, of course, was the tense situation in the Far East. Did the Americans, did Roosevelt deliberately turn the screw on Japan in the confidence that Japan would go to war? We should never be able to answer this absolutely clearly. I'm inclined to think, no. I'm inclined to think that right up to the last minute, the Americans really thought, or quite not to the last minute, but until a few minutes before, until October 1941, perhaps early November, they really thought that the Japanese faced with this rigid uh, blockade, with a cut off of their oil, the Japanese would compromise, would draw back from some of their conquests and seek a settlement, a settlement which would have had to be won, not quite a surrender, but at any rate a withdrawal, with the Americans. The Japanese on their side had no hesitation. They had decided they were going to break the ring. Where they uh, hesitated was exactly how to do it, but we know that quite a long time before Pearl Harbor, they had decided that the American fleet must be eliminated and that this would give them security. Hitler may have talked about dominating the world. The Japanese had no such fantasies. They wanted to establish the Far Eastern co-prosperity sphere, and with that, they would be content. Uh, they sprang into action. They undertook the attack on Pearl Harbor on December the 7th, 1941. Not linked up with the European war. In fact, they got their timing absolutely wrong because on the 7th of December, 1941, the Soviet armies began a counteroffensive. Maybe if the Japanese had hesitated one more day, they'd have pulled back and realized they'd missed the bus. As it was, they started the world war, or quite, not quite. Hitler finally launched the Second World War by his uh, declaration of war on America. Why did he do it? The most extraordinary assistance to the Allies, we shall never know. Well, perhaps that marks the moment when the Second World War began, but perhaps not. Churchill certainly thought it was later, because he said after the Battle of Alamein in October 1942, this may not be the beginning of the end, but it is the end of the beginning.